I would die before I buy one of these three car brands. Yes, I believe every car has a place. Like they say, every seat has a butt to fill it. Whether you need something cheap like this just to get around. Maybe you need something more luxurious like this so you can show the bosses at your work. Like this all wheel drive so it gets you around. Maybe you want a small SUV, maybe something more performance oriented. There's almost a vehicle for every type of person, but there are still three key vehicle manufacturers I would never buy. I would rather die before even purchasing. Let's get into it now. Life's too short to drive boring cars. So here's the first manufacturer I would never ever buy. Do you remember go back many many years ago back to the 1980s and they had a car called the Hyundai XL and the Hyundai Pony. The Pony was a mess. You never saw any of them outside of five or six years of age because they all burned up, blew up and every single one of them you saw blue smoke blowing out the backside. If it wasn't a catastrophic engine failure or worn out piston rings it was an electric failure that took it out and none of them lasted very long. The Hyundai XL was a slightly stretched version, slightly larger, but still junk. Now decades later, Hyundai right here has done a lot of great things in terms of, you know, they've really escalated the brand and they brought it to a place where it's much better than it ever used to be. First of all, most of the cars built by that manufacturer are relatively boring and ho-hum. A lot of them are driven by CVTs, that elastic band transmission, which is pulleys and belts, and they shiv in, shiv out to give you different velocities and engine RPMs. They're the least performance oriented transmission. They're the least fun and they're most problematic. Now, other things that I can honestly say, a lot of these vehicles, sure, they're trying to compete with the likes of the Toyotas and Hondas. And while they look a lot like it, and I would give kudos to these brands here, Hyundai specifically, for some of the styling that they've done and some of the improvements on the technology and the cost point, the fact remains is the price point has come up quite dramatically. And in my opinion, for small displacement, weak drivetrains, bad transmissions is no justification for the price tag that they're selling these for now. Another thing you have to think about are the literal recalls that plague this manufacturer. Clearly, Hyundai and Kia, brother-sister company, have had millions of recalls. Where do we begin and end? What type of failures are we starting to see with a variety of these different Hyundais? Some people I know will argue and say, hey, I've got 120,000 miles out of my car. But that's only people that are in denial. The reality is there's way too many people that have seen problems related to a few issues here, let's go. There's cases where wiring harnesses through the engine compartment are pulled too tight and they go over a component. And when you throttle the engine, it actually twists that harness and it rips it apart, causing either catastrophic failure, sparks, ignition under the hood, or even potentially just shorting something out so it stops working electrically. There's also a lot of problems electrics related to lights and some of the other gauges and detail inside the vehicle tow hitch on some of the late model vehicles that actually have wiring to there are also known to short out. There's been issues with some of the electrics throughout the different generations and years of Hyundai's. I will also comment if you look down here go follow this path down here and you'll see the panel gap isn't the best here. As you can see it's tighter up here. You go down here it's a little wider in this area. So it's not necessarily the nicest put together vehicle either and fit and finish while it's not terrible, it's not Lada Neva style, it's certainly not the best that I've ever seen. It's not worth its weight in coal. Now there's been lots of other issues. Where do we start? Transmissions, yes. There's been problems with some of these vehicles stalling inadvertently related to fuel pumps or just bad programming. There's been lots of issues related to engines and this is where things get ugly. If you do a quick recall search across the internet, just do it. Recall cars, cars recalled. Guaranteed, Hyundai and Kia are at the top of the list for vehicles that are recalled drastically the most. The only other vehicle might be up there are some Fords as well as some Teslas. But the problem with a lot of the recalls related to a lot of the Hyundai products here, we're talking about the Theta engines. You know, some of those engines, you go back four, five, six years ago, where you're talking about catastrophic engine failures. You've probably seen a lot of it all over the internet, where people have pulled over, they're all of a sudden their check engine light comes on, the car starts rattling, making weird noises. They pull over, all of a sudden they jump out of the car and poof! There's big flames coming out from under the hood. Why? That's because a lot of those stated engines, and there was other engines as well plugged in there. You'll have to check out my other videos for more detail on that. But the problem with those are there was some machining. When they build the engine, there's machining. They machine all the parts to find tolerances. 
but a lot of that metallics would make its way into the oil cooling passages, but it would eventually flush through and sometimes get hung up in the lower sections of the rods. So the rod bearings would sometimes get plugged off, they wouldn't get the oiling needed, and often that meant it would overheat, sometimes it would just burn, and sometimes the engine would catastrophically fail. It may knock. Hyundai and Kia, they came up with some mitigations, you know, knock detection programs, software updates, hardware to try to mitigate some of that, but that was all smoke and mirrors. In my personal opinion, it got so bad that they basically said, you know what, we have to almost abandon ship here, go with a full new, completely new engine, direct injected and then move to electrification altogether. But wait a minute, you think that solved it? No, how about the Hyundai Kona for example? With the engines that didn't just fail because of the rod bearings and the metallics within the cooling orifices, they actually had engines failing because the piston rings would break and they'd hang up in the cylinder walls, scoring the cylinder, cylinder walls, resulting in knock, banging, oil consumption, and outright catastrophic boom again. So the list goes on and on. So here's the thing. Generally, I'm all about giving a guy a break, but the th problem with Hyundai is if it's not one thing, it's another. If it's not that other thing, it seems to be something else. And it's not simple stuff. It's engine related. And when you have catastrophic engines breaking, blowing up, burning, even in reasonable numbers, that's way too many. And they've been clearly a target of NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, for some of those catastrophic engine failures. That's right, a lot of people are getting put out by some of these problematic engines. And honestly, until I see a serious track record without major catastrophic failures, I still don't put the faith in this and I'll never buy one of these Hyundai products until I see things get drastically better. Now another car manufacturer you'll actually never see me buy. Now that comes with a caveat because I bought one of its cousins, its distant cousin vehicles, but this particular vehicle I'll never buy. There's just way too much associated with it on the negative side. The benefits definitely don't even come close to the negatives and we're talking about right here. We're talking about the Range Rover. That's a brand you'll never see me owning and I hate to say this because I think they're gorgeous and clearly you have to be rich like the King and Queen of England, both of them, not just one of their salaries, both of them to actually be able to afford to run one of these reasonably for a period outside of warranty. As a matter of fact, why do you think this manufacturer is starting to go down for the count. Why do you think Jaguar even, for example, is starting to discontinue, so the whole JLR group discontinuing some of their models? Why do you think some of these manufacturers go in pure EV? Because they can't tolerate the type of abuse these vehicles will subject on the warranty period. Clearly it's a gorgeous vehicle, but I wanna talk about this, why I would not buy this. Now clearly, Range Rover. What are we dealing with here? This is a big daddy Range Rover right here. And while it looks very, very sharp, it has all the greatest you know, tail light details and technology, beautiful exhaust sounds out of a lot of these vehicles. A lot of them actually come with great V8s, so they sound wonderful, and they have more than enough jam to get up and go. I mean, they always have stylish rims, and they have beautiful handles, and you'll notice the, all the technology you could possibly muster up into one square package like this, they would incorporate in this vehicle. And that's part of the problem. There's too much technology in these vehicles, and that technology is a big part of why you really can't afford to own one of these outside of warranty. And if I can't own a vehicle for at least five to 10 years, meaning well outside of warranty, I don't want it, I don't need it, and I can tolerate some repairs and maintenance. I mean, I've driven Porsches and Beamers and Jags and Benzes. I'm not unaccustomed to actually have to pay from, for some significant maintenance and repairs. But this one takes things to a whole new level. I mean, it's one thing to replace a water pump, which by the way, these fail frequently, but that's just a mechanical part, put it in, flush it, and away you go. When you have electric failures, that usually means that vehicle goes into the shop and spend days, weeks, while the technicians go through it and try to figure out, and nickel and dime, try to figure out what's going on. And at 200 bucks an hour shop rate, trust me when I say you have an electrical failure in one of these vehicles, ouch. You must have take out a third and fourth mortgage just to stay ahead of it. But there's other problems with these vehicles too. I mean, a lot of the engines, we're talking serious engine failures. Yes, catastrophic en engine failures. Some of these, especially in the sports, if you go to the last generation HSE Sport, you're talking about timing chains and the ramps, and they break. And if timing chains break, there was actually a recall and a class action on that one. And if they break, that means piston and valve, boom! And then it's all over and it's huge box, everyone. Coolant lines, oil lines, I mean, this thing leaks, and leaks good. 
I mean, we also talk about problems with the emergency brake system here or the park brake. You pull it and it doesn't sometimes let go. So if you got to take it in to get it fixed or diagnosed, that's going to cost you big money. Obviously, that's one problem. The transmission, not the worst. Some of these in the ZF automatic transmissions aren't the worst, but they are known to be a little aggressive and a little abrupt. Rear differentials can be a problem with some of these, as can be the front transfer case on, case on some of these vehicles too. I've also heard of owners, and I know people individually specifically who own these vehicles, and even body panels inside that should be there for life pop off. So clearly they're not put together in the best of fashion. Now another big issue that can impact some of these Range Rover, Land Rover products, as you can see this vehicle sitting quite low and that's the air ride self-leveling system. Air systems, there's pumps and levelers and bags and all those pieces of equipment that can fail and when they do their big money. It's very similar to the X5 that has that leveling system. When those bags go, you're talking a few thousand dollars. If the compressor goes, it must cost another couple grand. Those parts are common failure points and they, and they cost lots of money. But it's not just that particular. We're talking, I'm really taking a toll on the Range Rover specific. But even here we have the Velar. Here's another product from the Land Rover group. And this is also gonna be bunched in. Obviously, similar issues. Transmission where it locks up and you can't move the vehicle. You actually have to tow it and you have to take it off its wheels and get it skidded because there's software and other mechanical issues with some of the transmission problems here. These cars as well, engine problems, coolant, oil, and the works. As well, I don't wanna forget about some of these that you'll find on some of the JLR products like this. They get iced over in winter time and they won't open or they won't close, and that jams up and can be a problem as well. Lots of electrics in these vehicles that will lead to troubles and heartache. And just sadly, unless you have a warranty that's unlimited for life, I wouldn't bother with one of these Range Rovers. They're definitely going to break the bank, and that's why I would rather die before buying a Range Rover. And another manufacturer, I would never... Yeah, I'd buy one. Actually, I have one of these. And I would never buy, ever, I'd rather die before buying one of these, is this vehicle brand right here. What are we talking about here? Well, clearly it's a Jeep. And, you know, I can pretty much list off any of the specific models, and they all just disgust me. So here's the deal. Here we're looking at a Compass. Not a well-made vehicle. Yeah, they're now went from a 9-speed to an 8-speed. They're turbo 4. They're trying to do little things to try to spice it up, but it's poor, poor fuel economy, poor build quality, and it's generally just lacking in luster. It's essentially just a crap box. And then over here we have another one. This is a Cherokee. So this is the smaller, you know, you've got the Grand Cherokee, you've got the smaller Cherokee. Remember the old boxy Cherokees way back in the 90s. They weren't bad, but they weren't well made either, but they were at least simple. Now you have this newer style of Cherokee. It looks basically like a unibody minivan type vehicle. Problem is with this, transmission issues, oil consumption, electrics again, failures. As a matter of fact, this Cherokee is such a piece of junk that actually it's so unpopular now people aren't buying them. And yes, they're actually been discontinued here. So if you think in 2025, you're gonna go buy a new one of those, not gonna happen. So clearly, Stellantis, Jeep, specifically the Jeep products are ones which I've never been a fan of and quite frankly the Wrangler tops that heap of junkers. Now we're taking this to a new level. It's not just about those little grab boxes. We also have more and more of these. Like you'll see them on the lot. You can't get rid of these. But now we have the bigger SUVs as well. The Grand Cherokees. Back in the day, bigger engines. They actually had that roll away problem. You hear about that with the transmission that wouldn't fully engage? Rolled away and taking that person out. So there's problems with transmissions with all of those Grand Cherokees. Some of the engines are oil burners, some aren't. Lots of electrical problems. And then I can add to that. So with the Grand Cherokees or any of these little junky SUVs or even the Wranglers, here's another big problem. Quality control, transmissions on some of them are good, some aren't. Have you heard of the Tiger Shark engine? Yeah, that's their little tiny SUV that Jeep's running too, the Renegade. Tiger Shark, 2.4 liter junk box. Yeah, in other words, oil consumption. It is actually pumps out so much CO2 as well that it exceeds the target, honestly, junk. A lot of it has to do with oil consumption and fuel consumption, just not a good engine. And the only benefit with that one is that you could get a manual transmission. But with some of these vehicles, they're just not well made. The Wrangler, 
any of these modern day Jeeps, I have to say, have you ever heard of something called the Tipum? That's the totally integrated power module. All your lights and controls and even a fuel pump, a lot of your pieces that run this vehicle, the essentials, electrically, go through that Tipum. Well, that Tipum is a very commonly known failure point for a lot of Dodge products, Jeep products, Stellantis, a lot of these vehicles have that tough Tipum issue. And when that goes, we're talking, you know, a few thousand dollars to get it rectified, only to fix it, and it could come back shortly again. So the problem is, they're not well made, they got problem areas like the Tipum, which afflicts almost every single modern day Jeep product, which just makes them a nightmare to run. Not to mention, a lot of vehicles like the Wrangler are way overpriced. We can't forget about some of the bigger SUVs, and even this midsize, like, like the Jeep Grand Cherokee, overpriced, they're almost at BMW X5 premium engine territory. But no, they're not, they're not a luxury vehicle, but the problem is Stellantis is trying to pump up Jeep and make it sound like a luxury brand. The problem is the quality's not there, the performance isn't there, the technology is hit and miss. Honestly, Jeep is one of those brands you'll never see me buy either. Poor build quality, junk, trash, oil burning, weak transmissions, some with CVTs. You'll never see me in one of those. And with all of that said, check it out right there. That's of some of the worst luxury SUVs for 2024. Hope to see each and every one of you on the next one. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.